shakes and crumbles and shatters, he'll be there. Nation Forgets God, Pastor Erwin Lutzer tells a story about an, an interview with an eyewitness to the events in Nazi Germany. And I want you to listen to the story. I lived in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust. I considered myself a Christian at that time. We had heard stories of what was happening to the Jews, but we tried to distance ourselves from it because, after all, what could we do to stop it? A railroad track ran behind our small church, and each Sunday morning we could hear the whistle of the train in the distance, and then the wheels coming over the tracks would follow. We became disturbed when we heard the cries coming from the train as it passed by. We realized it was carrying Jews like cattle in the cars. Week after week, the whistle would blow. We dreaded to hear the sound of those wheels because we knew that we would eventually then hear the cries of the Jews en route to a death camp. Their screams tormented us. We grew to know that the, the time that the train would come, and when we heard the whistle blow from far off, we would begin singing hymns. By the time the train came past our church, we were singing at the top of our voices. If we heard the screams, we sang more loudly and soon heard them no more. Although years have passed, I still hear the train whistle in my sleep. God forgive me, God forgive all of us who called ourselves Christians and yet did nothing to intervene. My guess is that like me, when you hear that true story, your heart breaks and your stomach actually sinks. And you say, how, how could it be that Christians in a church service, when people were passing by on their way to a death camp, sang louder to drown out their cry for help. And maybe they couldn't go and storm the camp, but they could have prayed, they could have done something to help, and, and yet there was actually an expression of religious devotion to quiet the cries of those in great need. We're in a series right now called Revival. We're talking about making room for God to move again. We are saying from the book of Habakkuk, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day, in our time. Make them known. What we've seen so far in the first four weeks of our series is that revival can happen. We saw that vision of a valley filled with dry bones, and they came back to life. God can do the miraculous. Revival happens when God's people pray. Revival happens when God's people worship him and him alone. We have to decide if we're going to worship the gods of the culture and we're going to worship the things that we love and we prefer, or we're going to allow God to reign supreme and uncontested of the, in the throne of our lives. Last week, we learned that revival happens when God's people respond to God's word. One of the, the, the most precious images I have in my mind came last week when dozens of men from this church came forward and they they bowed their knees at the front of the stage and they had tears streaming down their face, pledging and praying to put God's word more central in their hearts. And it wasn't just the image of them, it was the image of many of their, their wives or, or, or mothers or daughters behind them now standing by themselves in the pew, filled with joy at the pledge that their husband or son or brother were making. The Lord is doing great work. What we're going to see now in week five is revival awakens compassion and mercy. Revival awakens compassion and mercy. Sometimes when people conjure up in their minds what revival is characterized by, they're going to think, oh, more time at church. Like people just come to church a lot. Back in the day when I grew up, revival was a series of church meetings, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night. Some people think, okay, there's going to be continuous prayer, or we're going to read our Bibles more. And all of those things are a part of revival. People do end up spending more time in the house of the Lord. They spend more time praying. They spend more time reading the Bible. But a true revival, like the, the, one of the telltale signs that God is really up to something miraculous, is when compassion and mercy spill out of the church and transforms the community that that church calls home. Uh, we see this numerous times in Scripture where God says, 
that he will pour out his presence and, and send a revival in correspondence with people willing to commit themselves to lives of true justice and righteousness. And though we see this a lot in scripture, one of the clearest examples we see anywhere is in the book of Isaiah. So if you brought your Bibles, will you please get them out and open them to Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. Now this is roughly, historical background here, uh, roughly 700 years before the time of Christ. God's people had come to a place of great spiritual need, and the Lord is going to highlight for them why they are in their place of spiritual need and the change, the repentance that they need to make. So let's go ahead and kick off Isaiah 58. We're going to look at the first few verses, and we'll read till the end of the chapter eventually. God says, shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet, like God wants everybody's attention. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. And what are the sins that God is getting ready to convey to his people? For, for day after day, they seek me out. They seem, they seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and they seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? So the people were claiming to be very religious, very devout. But God is getting ready to say that you are very religious but you lack real righteousness in your lives and in your society. Listen to how he calls them out as he continues. On the day of your fasting, you do as you please, and you exploit all your workers. Is that, is, is that like religious devotion to you? Your fasting ends in quarreling and, and strife and striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast that I've chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is this what you call a fast? A day that you think is acceptable to the Lord? God is saying, you can keep on fasting all you want. Fast until you lose all the weight that you could ever dream of and your diet plans is no longer relevant. Fast until your local grocery store runs out of business because people aren't even buying any food anymore. Do all that fasting that you want. But that is not the type of religious devotion that God is looking for. If you look throughout the entire Old Testament, go from Genesis all the way to Malachi, 39 books. How many times do you think God commanded his people to fast throughout the entire Old Testament? 39 books. Only twice, only two times does God command his people to fast. But hundreds upon hundreds of times, God says that you are to worship and honor me by extending compassion and mercy to those around you, by working for righteousness and justice in your society. So listen to the sort of repentance that God calls the Israelites to. Is not this the kind of fasting that I have chosen? This is what God really wants. This is true worship. Loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe them and not turn away from them, your own flesh and blood. God is saying the type of religious devotion that I want has nothing to do with eating food or not eating food. It has to do with how you care for people. Quit raising your hands in worship. If you are not going to, also extend those same hands that you raised in worship out to those who are near you, who have a need. Raise them in worship all you want, but make sure there is consistency with the hands you raise in worship and the hands you extend to help people who are around you in need of compassion and mercy. Enough with religious posturing. God wants real mercy in the lives of his people. And he says, when you do this, when there's repentance and actual righteousness in your relationships, God honoring righteousness, he says, then revival's going to come. 
Then your, your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing of finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in the sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be a well-watered garden like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. These are some of the most inspirational, broad-spectrum promises for revival and renewal anywhere in the entire Bible. And I, I want you to just take note, if you were to compress all of these verses and promises, take note of what God is saying he will do for us if we live with real righteousness, compassion, and mercy in our lives. God will light your way in the darkness and move quickly to heal you. God will send his righteousness before you and his glory behind you. God will answer your prayers and make his personal presence known to you. God will guide you, satisfy you, and strengthen you. And then finally, God will allow you to participate in history-changing miracles. That's a picture of revival. That is what God is promising to do for his people when they respond with compassion, righteousness, justice, and mercy in their relationships. Not religious posturing, not day after day of fasting. Transformed relationships characterized by mercy and compassion. And friends, this is something that not only emphasized in Isaiah 58, it's emphasized throughout Isaiah and the rest of the scriptures. To kick the book of Isaiah off in Isaiah chapter 1, the Lord says, learn to do right, seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. We see in Jeremiah, the Lord says, I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for in these I delight. We see in the book of Zechariah, this is what the Lord Almighty says, administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. In the book of Micah, what does the Lord require of you? What is it that God wants? Act justly. Love mercy and walk humbly with your God. You flip the pages to the New Testament. In the, in the book of James, we read, suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? We're learning here in, in the book of James that it's not enough to simply speak positively or, and wax poetic about people in need in your life. You can't just like put some cheery words over the situation. You can't just have good feelings in your heart towards them and you know, think positively as opposed to negatively. It doesn't mean anything unless you actually meet their needs. This is what God is wanting from his people. And this actually happened in the early church. In the early church, most historians, there's a bit of debate, did it begin in 30 AD or 33 AD? Most lean towards 33 AD. 33 AD, there's just 120 people who are followers of Jesus. And then in Acts chapter 2, the gospel is preached, the Holy Spirit descends, and 3,000 people are baptized that day. By Acts chapter 4, we now see that there are 5,000 men who are Christians. So sociologists say if you've got 5,000 men, then you probably have 15,000 believers with a spouse and, and children. 15,000 conservative estimate. And these people represented all spectrums of society. You had people who were upper class, middle class, and lower class. But what we know about history is that there were far more people in the lower class than in the middle or upper class. There was a lot of destitution and poverty with just a few percentage of people who had liberal financial means. So knowing that about the size of the church, knowing that about ancient sociology, take a look at what we read in Acts chapter 4. There were no needy persons among them. 
There were no needy persons among them in the early church. Now, how could that be with a group 15,000 strong, not just with wealthy elites, a few people who had excess, but the vast majority of the church were impoverished? How can you have thousands upon thousands of people in the early church and there be no needs among them? Well, luckily, the Bible answers that question. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. The reason there was no need among them was because those who had extra sold what they had and joyfully, consistently, and without having their arm twisted, without being manipulated, they brought it to the leaders of the church. And the leaders of the church didn't use it for their own enrichment. They immediately turned around and took care of people in the community. It's a beautiful picture of life in the early church. And it allowed the Christians to participate actively in the Lord's Prayer. So we actually said part of the Lord's Prayer earlier today as we were receiving communion. But I want us to turn our attention to Matthew chapter 6 and be reminded of the opening section of the Lord's Prayer. This is how Jesus taught us, his disciples, to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. I really want to focus on that final phrase that we've highlighted. Give us today our daily bread and really focus on the pronoun here. Give us today our daily bread. Often when we say this prayer or when we reflect on its meaning, we personalize this prayer. Like, give us today our daily bread, and the, uh, the request is that I would be fed today. Or if I represent a family, I'm the head of a household, God, give me and my spouse, give me and my kids, give me and, 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 and our grandkids what we need. But this is actually a prayer for the church. This is not just about me and my needs and my family and their needs. This is about God's people and all of their needs. So when we pray, God, give us today our daily bread, we're asking God to provide for all of his children. And that means that if you have two people in the household of God and one has been provided with two loaves of bread and the other has zero loaves of bread, God has answered the prayers that were offered. But in order for that prayer to be answered in a way that changes lives, the person who has two loaves has to renounce greed and selfishness and hoarding and has to willingly share their extra with a person who doesn't have any. And that is where throughout history so many people have been caught up. The idol of greed, the love of self, the fascination with money and and, and, and amassing wealth. It has prevented God's people from witnessing with their own eyes the answer to that prayer. Our problem in the world is not with an, enough resources. It has always been about the distribution of resources. But in the early church, they got it. Those who had extra from time to time, joyfully, consistently, without without manipulation and, ha and having to like beg and plead. They just, they just brought it to the church and the church met the needs of everyone. This was described beautifully by a, a man in the early church named Aristides of Athens. Here you see a, a rendering of Aristides. He lived in the early second century AD and he wrote an apology in roughly the year 125. He's, he's just like one or two generations after the apostles and the church had been growing. Aristides of Athens, you see his image here. Uh, he lived, as you can tell, in Athens. He was a philosopher. He was a very high-ranking member of ancient society. Athens was like the intellectual capital of the world. He lived there as a philosopher. He grows up a pagan. He's committed to all the gods that the Greeks and the Romans worshipped. The gospel falls before him. He converts and becomes a Christian. And he writes this apology, which is a defense of the Christian religion, and it is directed specifically to the emperor of Rome. He writes the most powerful man in the world at that time, and he says, I've got two motivations 
in sending this letter. One, I want to explain the heart of the Christian religion to you so that you will stop persecuting and killing Christians. And two, I want to explain Christianity to you so that you will turn your back on these lifeless gods and place your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. So this man, even when Christianity is persecuted and you get killed for it, he owns his faith publicly and he writes a letter to the emperor. And he says, emperor, here is why everyone in your, in your empire is turning to follow Christ. Even though you arrest them, you dispossess them of all that they own, you throw them in prison, you put them in the gladiatorial games, and you have lions rip their limbs apart, they are still placing their faith in Jesus, and here's why. He says, when our church meets together for worship, if someone comes from the outside, they don't even believe in Jesus like we do, but they come and they ask for, for help, they come and ask for food. If we have the resources, if we have the food, we instantly give it to them because God was so generous in giving us what we needed. And then he says, if we don't have the resources, if we have no extra food, those in our church, this is the second century AD. He says, those in our church, we will all fast for two or three days. And what little we had, which we would have provided for ourselves to be able to eat, we will direct all of those resources to the wanderer or to the impoverished and we will fast so that they can have food. And he says, our Lord and Savior allowed his body to suffer so that our needs could be met. And so we follow in his footsteps, allowing our bodies to, to suffer and to hunger so that we can generously extend the needs, generously meet the needs of others in our community. He tells that to the, to the emperor of Rome. And if you look throughout history, from the year 33 AD to the year 350 AD, the church went from having 3,000 people to having 33 million people. 40% growth decade over decade for over 30 decades. It is the first and the greatest revival in history. And it was sustained for centuries. And a large part of the, the power of that revival is the compassion and mercy that was distributed from the church to those in need. It won the lost world and ultimately overcame a godless empire to even the place where the empire of Rome renounced their pagan religion and claimed Jesus Christ as Lord. It happened when God's people extended compassion and mercy. And if we want to see a sustained revival in our day, it's going to be empowered and moved along as God's people renounce selfishness, renounce greed, renounce hoarding, and freely give to others just like God has so freely and generously given to us. One of the really practical and specific ways we want to let you know about a pathway that you can participate in to extend compassion and mercy is to engage with our mission partner, Mission of Hope International. They're colloquially known around here as MOHI. Uh, Mohi is doing incredible work all around the world in some of the most impoverished and destitute places. They go in and with a holistic approach, they do community development, they do church strengthening, and it's all in a way to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, orphanages and schools, uh, long-term education, which breaks the cycle of poverty, they are doing a great work. We have been official partners with Mohi for the last 12 years. When you give to the creek, you're not only keeping our lights on and allowing us to do things in the Indianapolis area. We take a very generous portion of our budget, and every year we give to partners like Mohi to help some of the, the people on the, the far fringes of, of, of the margins in the world today. I want to give you a, a picture of the neighborhood where we partner with Mohi in Kenya. And with this picture, these are just rows of houses I want you to think, in, instead of just holding this picture in your mind, put next to it the picture of the neighborhood that you drove through to come to church today. This is a little house for a family of four or five. It's about 120 or 150 square feet. I want you to think about the house that you woke up in today, or the apartment you woke up in today. Our brothers and sisters in Christ in Kenya have so little. And with the 
the support that you've given to this church for the last 12 years, we have been able to buy some land right next to the slum. We've been able to uh, construct the first stages of a school, and that school has over 800 children in it. And a lot of those children, a little more than half of them, have a sponsor. They have an individual or a family from America who is contributing $40 a month to help pay their school tuition, to get them, um, to get them the uniform that they need, to help with nutrition and, and food. But we have over 430 kids in that school that you helped to build that don't have a sponsor yet. Just for a visual representation, this is about 430 kids connected with Mohi, and they're all raising their hands, they're saying hi, but I like to look at that and say they're, they're raising their hands and they're asking, they're asking for a little bit of help. And we have a church, as a church we have an opportunity today to say we're going to put our religion into practice. We're not going to just call ourselves Christian and raise our hands in worship. We're going to proudly wear the name of Christ and raise our hands in worship, but then we are going to generously extend our hands to those in need. I'm going to explain ways that we can sign up for partnership, but we're really blessed today to have a young man who's a part of this church. This is his faith family. He was baptized here. Now, he grew up, he was born in Africa, grew up in Africa, and he was personally blessed by receiving sponsorship from a family in America before he was adopted by a family in this church. So I want you to take a few moments and let's listen to Moses Stevenson share part of his testimony with us. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not harm you. you I have plans to give you hope and a future. My name is Moses Stevenson. I am a sophomore at Franklin Central High School. I am a state crow fighter for wrestling. I am a musician. I am from Uganda. I'm adopted. And most importantly, I'm a follower of Christ. I share daily sermons on social media. But before any of this though, I was a sponsored child and this is how it changed my life. Hey guys, welcome back to another video. I hope you are having a wonderful Sunday. And today's video is gonna be a little different. I'm gonna be telling you guys my testimony of how God has been there throughout my whole life and how God has always been watching over me and how he has always just been with me and protecting me. So I am from Uganda. I was born in a village and I was with my stepdad my one sister and two brothers, and I was the youngest of, of all of them. And my mom was sick, and my dad was, didn't have a lot of money to provide for my siblings, so we had to find a way for me to be taken care of. My stepdad sent me to my grandma's, and that's where I spent some of my years. It was at my grandma's. There was many problems with her and many problems with just money and she was uh, an alcoholic. I couldn't live a good life or proper life over there. So that's when my grandma and my stepdad, they all decided to take me to my uncle. And then my uncle took me to an orphanage. God put me in this orphanage where I could get an education and I could get so many things that I did not have at my village. I could have a meal every day to eat. I got to go to church, I got to play soccer, I made friends and I worked in the farm a lot. And every once in a while, I'll get gifts from these people. I'll get food, candy, and I'll get like school uniforms and soccer balls and toys from these people that I had no idea about. And I was able to go to school, and I always wondered how am I able to go to school if my family can't take care of me. Every year, I'll get letters from them asking me how I was and how I'm living and just what kind of things I like. And I had no idea about was paying for my school fees, one day when I, when I was at the orphanage, about like two years into the orphanage, I got a call that my mom passed away because of her disease. And because of that, I was able to be adopted. And one day I just got a phone call saying that some people coming over the next day and 
It was my mom and dad, Matt and Amanda Stevenson. This was a crazy call because I never imagined myself being adopted to America. To know that I was getting adopted, especially with people like Matt and Amanda, my parents, people who actually cared about me and people who loved me, that was just super special to me. And just it just it changed my life. And without sponsorship, I don't think I'll be where I am. It's all praise the Lord, because I never imagined, I never imagined it. Yeah. Looking back on my Ugandan life, even though I went through some troubles and some trials, I realize now that God has always been there for me, and he's just always been protecting me. God made a way even when my dad couldn't take care of me. He made a way even when my mama passed away. He made a way and he protected my sisters and my family. I never knew how kind God could be. I never knew someone out there could be so kind to bless someone like me, to bless an, a little orphan boy, to bless a little kid from Uganda who had no hope for their future. And I know for sure God is blessing those people. Even though I have no idea who they are, I know that the Lord is blessing them because Proverbs 19:70 says, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deeds. If the person ever listens to this, and I don't know if they will, if they ever do, I just want to let them know, thank you for everything they have done. And without you, I could never be in the position I am in today. Because of you, I was able to do many things. I'm able to connect people to Jesus through my story. Because of you, I'm able to play sports. I'm able to go to school. I'm able to make music for the Lord. I'm able to show the same people the kindness that you showed me. If someone is thinking about sponsoring, I'll tell him that even though you might not think that you're making an impact, I'll tell him that you are making a huge impact because when those kids who might not have the right opportunities as people here, those same those kids are, are thinking about you the whole time. You know, might be, you might not be thinking about them the whole time, but they're thinking about you and they have the hope in you and they know that they have someone else here that's that's watching over them and that's taking care of them. You're just making a huge impact on those kids even when you don't think you are. And whoever you are, I want to let you know that don't give up. Don't give up because there's always hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. We're really fortunate not just to get to watch that video, but we're actually going to have Moses join us on stage. So would you join me in welcoming Moses Stevenson to our stage? Uh, Moses is a truly exceptional, inspirational young man, and I thought it'd be nice to just ask you a few questions. Uh, but you mentioned in that video that almost every day you get online and on social media you record a sermon, and it goes out to friends and people who follow you. And what is it that inspired you to want to, on a daily basis, put that message out there for friends and followers to receive? Um, yeah, um, I just... Uh, I love the Lord Jesus, and I just love the way he's been working through my life, and I just want to show that love to other people, and I just want to use everything that I have for God's glory, and I just want to connect as many people to Jesus as, as my humanly body can, and I just want to serve the Lord. Yeah. What, a, what a heart. <laughs> I think we can, every one of us, apply that in our own lives. Uh, you... You knew what it was like uh, to grow up in a place where you and your family had so little, and then you went from not having a sponsor to having a sponsor. Now help us as a church understand in a practical terms the difference that is made if you're in that sort of situation. What difference is made when a, when a young kid gets a sponsor? Um, it's a huge impact, especially to my family in Uganda. Who are who are might be struggling? It just encourages my family over there to know that um, they have a, a baby boy in America that that has a that could have a future for them and that's making that could just a, impact their family in in many big ways and it's a, it's a blessing. What would you share with our folks if they were kind of wondering like? If they needed a little bit of extra encouragement, like wondering, like, is, if, if, if we make this commitment, is it really going to make an impact? What would, what would you share with us as extra motivation to really consider sponsoring a child? 
Yeah, um, I would say that it, it blesses kids' lives, and I just want to say that, like, even if you don't think it is, um, it just know that you are impacting those kids' lives in so many ways that you can't, you can't imagine, and it's just, yeah, you, you're going to bless so many kids' lives. Thank you for sharing that. I thought it would be appropriate to ask Moses uh, to pray over us and pray that uh, God helps us be, to be a church. And this isn't brand new, but to continue to be a church that, per, that puts the needs of those in this world um, where it belongs and that we are moved with compassion and mercy to, to worship God with the heart that he, desi- that he desires and deserves. Would you pray for us? Yeah. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to pray right now. I pray for this church right now. God, I pray that, that this church will be a church of compassion for people, mm-hmm. God. And I pray for whoever might be thinking about sponsoring. And just, God, I pray that you just show them that this the sponsoring kids is something that would change many kids' lives. And God, I just pray that you just come upon their hearts and just um, let them know that they're loved by you, and thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Moses. We love you, and we are very proud of you. We are very, very proud of you, young man. So, in talking about joining with Missions of Hope International and sponsoring a child, uh, here's what that looks like in a practical way. Uh, Around the worship center, you can kind of see these uh, different uh, great, and there are slots in all of them where we have dozens and dozens of, of sheets that have the picture and the name and a little biographical information of the kids that go to our school that have not yet been sponsored. And the opportunity is to, if you feel led by the Spirit, there's no pressure here to do this. There's no social manipulation. This is really just if you want to respond as an expression of worship. Um, you could grab one of these, and if you do, it would be a $40 a month commitment. So think in terms of $500 a year to help a child with nutrition, have multiple quality meals a day, with education, it's going to provide their tuition for that school, with uniforms, with a few toys, and it's going to help them have every opportunity at a young age to know Jesus Christ and put him as Lord and Savior of their life. I'm going to offer a couple of suggestions about ways people could respond, because I think there's a spectrum. One, one opportunity is for you or for you and your family to say, we want to sponsor a child. And if you wanted to do that, that would be such a God-honoring expression of worship. Uh, that's one option. Uh, two, perhaps your family has a little bit extra right now, and in addition to your normal tithe and just like giving to the church, you want to go above and beyond your tithe and bring this as an offering to God, you might say, we want to do more than just one child. Uh, I, I'm kind of hesitant to share this honestly because it's, um, it's a strange thing to talk to publicly about. Jesus says, be very careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men. You have, to talk, you have to be very careful when you share these things, but God's blessed our family with a little extra. And so instead of sponsoring one child, the Hamill, the Hamill family this week decided to, to get three uh, children. And so our kids, as a Hamill family, we have Emmanuel, Ramsey, and Arion. God has blessed us with three biological children, two boys and a girl. So we went to, uh, to the tables here earlier in the week, and we chose two boys and a girl. And we just said, this, we want this to be a part of the Hamill family expression of, of worship to God. And we, we've been teaching our kids from the youngest of age that you have to honor God with your money. And so if our kids get money from grandma or grandpa or they get a few, they get a few nickels in an Easter egg that they open up or they, they find a quarter on the ground, I mean, they always give a portion of that to the Jesus jar. And we bring that to the church on a regular basis and we pray for the money that we give to this church. And we tell our kids that when you see people baptized, when you see people in worship, when you, when you see kids being dedicated to the Lord, you had an investment in life change and eternity growing. Like, we're trying to teach our kids that. And, and we thought this was such a practical way to help our kids Hudson and Addie and Luke learn about God's heart for those in need. We're going to be walking our kids down to the tin shack that is constructed in this building. And we're going, to, we're going to sit in that tin shack. And when we pray and we thank God for our blessings and we live, we live in a home that's much larger, we're going to talk about how good God has been to us and the responsibility we have to be good to those around us. 
we have decided that when it comes time for Christmas and it com comes times for birthdays, we are going to give our children less presents. Not zero presents, but less. And we want them to know that one of the reasons that they're getting less is so that we as a family and they as young kids can be a part of helping those on the other side of the world who have next to nothing. So maybe you and your family would say, uh, one child is wonderful for others. We have a little bit extra, and we want to give a little bit more. A third option is for those who own a business. And I wonder what it would look like for you as a business owner to sponsor a child or some children. How cool would it be if you hypothetically own a, a dental practice? And when people walked into your dental office and they were sitting there in the waiting room, instead of just seeing random art and you know, the news on TV, they saw one or multiple children from Kenya that your practice was sponsoring. And that could be true for any number of businesses out there. Maybe you run a business and you don't even have an office place, but you could just say for every one or every five or every 10 employees that, that we have on our books, we're going to sponsor a child. And at the DNA, the core of our business is going to be about extending God's compassionate heart to children in need. There's cool ways to do that as well. Give one, give for multiple, give as a business. Uh, a fourth option is just to pray. At a frank level, you might not be in a place where it's wise financially to commit to $40 a month, but it'd be so easy for you to just come to these racks, grab the name of a child. You don't have to take this paper. Just grab the name and say, I'm going to commit to praying for this child. At a visual level, you want to know the difference that sponsoring a kid makes? Here are two shoes. And this is a picture from Pastor Emerson, who went to that school just last year. This is the shoe of a child who is sponsored and a child who is not. When you sponsor a kid, it really changes lives. So the way this would work is you would just, you know, go around the worship center or outside the worship center, and you would grab one of these. Please only grab one if you are 100% committed to filling out the information and sponsoring them. Otherwise, that kid will go unsponsored for months. If you grab one of these, you got to fill out the information. Otherwise, just wait. These will be available all month, so you don't have to do it today and rush if you're not really ready. But you can physically fill out all the information and tear it off. We would ask you to take home the top part that has the picture and the biographical information and name and leave the bottom part here at the church in the baskets around the room or with any of the volunteers around the worship center. They have lanyards and they would love to take that from you. What we did as the Hamill family is we got, off, we got our phones and there is a QR code that is unique to every one of these pages. You would just get your QR, phone, your QR, QR code, follow the link, and right there on your phone, you can fill out all your information. If you want to do multiple, that as soon as you fill out one of these, you can sign up other ones in about 20 seconds. They make it so convenient. With their app, you can write personalized messages to the sponsored children that you decide to commit to, and they can write back to you. There's wonderful ways. These kids really care for their sponsors. Again, we send mission trips to Kenya every year, and when our pastors show up there, these little children are coming to them and saying, hey, do you know Steve? Do you know Linda? Like, they know you, they, they, they care for you, they're grateful for you. And there's a chance again for us today to respond, to worship, to put revival into practice by moving with compassion and mercy if God so leads. So I'm going to pray. Like always, we're going to open the doors to the porch. If you would like to be prayed over, if you would like to express your faith and devotion to Jesus, we'd love to meet you at the porch. Like usual, there'll be a place up front for you to come and receive prayer in the worship center. But we have two songs for worship. And if you feel prompted and you know in your heart, hey, we want to sponsor a child or we want to sponsor children, you can get up and move around the worship center during these songs of praise and say, God, I'm going to worship you by putting your heart of compassion into practice and helping kids in need. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the ways you have so generously met our needs. I just thank you from the bottom of my heart for what we saw with Moses' testimony and how you rescued him from his situation and you brought him into a loving family and you, you brought him into your family. We thank you for the difference that partnership made for Moses. And I want to pray that for each person here who was truly prompted by you, that you would provide the resources generously to allow us to, to give to those in need. Help us to not be consumed by greed or selfishness or hoarding, 
but to look to others in need and with joy and with worship to you, extend a hand to help. God, as we worship, might this be worship in spirit and in truth.